Hi friends, my name is Sajid and welcome back. Today's video is going to be a recap of all of the books that I've read in the first half of the year. So that's everything between January and June, of course. As you may know, I have been doing reading vlogs in lieu of wrap-ups this year. I've been reading a little bit more lately, but I actually haven't been vlogging it because other than reading school and work, I haven't really been doing anything else. So I just don't really feel like vlogging right now. That's not to say I won't vlog again in the future, but I thought that I kind of wanted to switch back to doing like regular regular wrap-ups. And I want to spend a lot less time on my phone and thinking about like pulling out my phone to record things to put in a video. But because I've been reading a little bit more lately and I haven't really been vlogging, I thought that I might be able to do like a July wrap-up. I may read enough books this month to do a wrap-up and if I don't, I could probably do like a July-August wrap-up or something. But it didn't feel right in my brain that I started doing reading vlogs and then I'm going to like try transition to doing regular wrap-ups. I feel like I need to like, you know, create a little bit of balance there so I thought that I would just do a wrap-up for the first six months of the year and I didn't actually do any vlogging in the month of June after I came back from my trip to Guyana in May. I stopped vlogging altogether and I did read two books in June so I didn't get to talk about those at all. So that's what this video is going to be about. Sorry for the long intro but let's do a recap of the 11 books that I read between January and June. I'm gonna start off with some SFF, some science fiction and fantasy, and I actually have been reading the Wayward Children series this year by Shannon Maguire. If you don't know what the Wayward Children series is, it's basically a series of, I think it's up to like 10 novellas right now, and the books predominantly take place in this like boarding school that is also a rehabilitation center for children and teenagers who fell into rabbit holes and looking glasses and portals and doors that took them to fantasy worlds where they found a new home that they loved more than Earth. They made their own lives there, they enjoyed their lives there, and then through some unfortunate circumstance, they ended up tumbling back down to Earth with little to no chance of them going back to their fantasy worlds. So the entire series is kind of like about these kids sort of readjusting to Earth. But also, of course, some of them do get to go back and we get backstories of some of them and their times in the fantasy lands and whatnot. I have been enjoying the series so far. I wouldn't say that any of the books have really like struck my core and become my absolute favorites. I really did like the first book, Every Heart a Doorway, and I will say that Down Among the Six and Bones is probably my favorite of the three so far, and Beneath the Sugar Sky is like my least favorite of the three. They're all really good though, don't get me wrong, and I did buy the next two books in the series and I will be reading those fairly soon hopefully. And then after I read those two, I'll decide whether or not I want to continue on with the series because even though I'm enjoying it, as I said, it hasn't really hit that sweet spot for me as yet. But you can let me know in the comments down below if you're up to date on this series and whether or not you think it's with me continuing beyond the fifth book. I also listened to the audiobook of The Humans by Matt Haig. This is a science fiction story that's a little bit more on the kitschy, satirical side. It's about this alien from an advanced civilization who comes to Earth and he takes over the body of a particular math professor. He basically kills him and just sort of becomes his doppelganger and he does that because he wants uh, to murder his family and everybody he knows because the math professor actually was able to solve something called the Riemann's hypothesis which is this mathematical hypothesis that I'm not going to pretend to understand but basically if humans are able to solve this hypothesis which we have not been able to as yet um, it could mean like the rapid advancement of our civilization it could be the foundation of that but the aliens don't want that because they don't trust humans which can't blame them. So he comes to it, kills this guy, becomes his doppelganger, and is now trying to figure out who this guy told his, like, secrets to so he could try to see who he has to kill. More than likely, he has to kill the man's wife and son, but the gag is he ends up kind of falling in love with them, and he falls in love with Earth, and it, you know, it causes tensions with his superiors. Other than the story itself, this is meant to be sort of like a commentary on human culture in general, I suppose. I mean, it's about white people in England, so maybe not in general, but it does sort of like question some of the things that many of us may consider to be like fundamental to, to being a human, to being a person. Like, for example, wearing clothes. A lot of the book sort of deconstructs like what we think is natural, what we think is normal, and what we think is, you know, like innate. So it's a really clever and interesting commentary on all those types of things. I liked it. Do I think it was the best book ever? No. I don't quite see what the Matt Haig hype is as yet, but I do suspect that this is probably not the best first book to read from him. So maybe I'll read a couple more books from him and I will understand why people 
like really rave for this author. I read Birdie by Tracy Lindbergh earlier this year, which I really, really had high expectations when I wanted to love, but I sadly did not. I don't want to blame the book itself. I think it really just has more so to do with where I was mentally when I read this book. This is the kind of book that requires a lot of focus and a lot of attention, and I was just not <laughs> in the headspace for this kind of story, and I didn't think that it would be that kind of story. It's about this woman from Cree Nation in Canada, and her name is Bernice, but everybody calls her Birdie. She seemed to have gone through something really traumatic in her life. I mean, her whole life is traumatic, but there was one particular event that happened, and we're not quite sure what that is as the reader as we're going into the story, but we know that it has left her in this sort of, like, paralyzing, depressive episode. And because of that, her storytelling and narrative is a bit unreliable, and we jump back and forth between her perspective and the perspectives of her family and some people in her lives. Some people in her life, not lives. She's not a cat. And it's also not told in, like, chronological order. We get a lot of, like, back and forth, jumping into the past, coming back to the present, and... All of that made for a really just haphazard reading experience, to be honest. The next few books I read were actually all set in Palestine. And, um, I mean, at this point, if you are not aware of, you know, what is happening, I don't even know what to tell you. Just go online, Google things, like, look up stuff, read stuff, educate yourself. Because I see so much, like, blatant ignorance from people when it comes to the issue of, like, what's happening in Palestine. And you could literally just solve that by, like, reading stuff, you know? And you don't even have to read, like, heavy non-fiction books and articles online. You could even read some fiction, because fiction also helps to educate you on, like, what's happening in certain parts of the world. So maybe take some of these as recommendations. The first one I'll definitely recommend is perhaps, like, it's not my favorite book of the year so far, anymore because I read some really hard hitters in July, but I'm not talking about those as yet. If I did the media book freak out tag this year, which I didn't do, but if I did do it, this would have definitely been the answer to the question of what's the best book of the year so far up until that point. Uh, because it was incredible. This is a young adult novel by one of my favorite young adult authors and it takes place in Palestine in the West Bank. We follow Hayat who is originally from a place called Bit Jalla, I believe. Her and her family lived there in a very lovely house until they were unfortunately displaced by the Israeli army. They now have to live in a cramped apartment in Bethlehem and when Hayat's grandmother falls ill, she decides that she wants to sneak over to West Jerusalem to collect some soil from the land that her grandmother came from originally before she was expelled before the Nakba and bring it back for her to touch because her grandmother always used to tell her that before she dies she would just like to be able to touch the soil of the land that she originally came from. So she grabs her best friend Sammy I believe is his name and they go on this really wild adventure from Bethlehem to West Jerusalem which is a very short journey I believe from what I understand but it takes an entire day for them to do it because as Palestinians from the West Bank they don't have the free mobility so they had to like jump through hoops to try and get across. It's essentially a story that explores the limited movement of Palestinians and how limited Palestinians are by their movement. In the same breath it's also about Hayat trying to make sense with her life and what's going on and being a child who was born into this thing that she has no control over. And healing from a really traumatic event in her childhood which left her with a huge scar or deformity on her face. Okay, I had to pause filming and completely forgot what I was saying before. But I was talking about this book and I was saying how much I really loved it and how much I thought it was a great exploration of life in Palestine and particularly the West Bank and the ways in which Palestinian people's movement is limited by the occupation. The other two books I read were actually translated from Arabic and one of the authors actually wrote an introduction in the other book. So this author is Adania Shibli and this book is Minor Detail and it was translated from Arabic by Elizabeth Jacquet. It's only 100 pages long so it's a novella in its own right and the first half of it is actually a true story. It's a story of a Bedouin girl who was raped and killed by early Israeli settlers in 1949 in the Nakab Desert. And then the second half of the story is about a woman who becomes obsessed with this story. So it takes place in like 21st century Ramallah and she decides to get herself in a car and to drive over to that part of the Nakab Desert to see if she could find the spot where 
what happened to this young woman happened. And we also go on a very similar journey as the main characters from this book. Um, it's not as animated, of course, but it is somewhat of a similar journey where she also has to pass through a bunch of checkpoints and deal with the limited mobility that is put on to Palestinian people from the West Bank. It actually went into quite a bit of detail on like the roads and the highways that the main character took when she was trying to find this part of the desert and what I did was I went on Google Earth and I kind of went on the journey with her and I saw like some of the places that she was going to and what was really interesting was that she was pointing out like you know this place used to be this village because she was comparing it to a map of historic Palestine so I'm going along with her on this journey and I'm seeing all of these places on the map on Google Earth but I'm also learning like what they used to be called what villages what Palestinian villages used to live there before Israel took it over. It made for a much more visceral reading experience and I would recommend that if you read this book to, to do that too especially with the second half of the story. It's so good and it's an absolutely necessary read. The next one here is called Out of Time by Samira Azam, which was translated by Rania Abdul Rahman. This is a collection of short stories, very, very short, short stories that were published posthumously by this author who died a really long time ago in 1967, I believe. She was known for her short fiction and she was known for writing stories about Palestine and Palestinian culture that were not necessarily focused on the occupation. She used to write about Palestine before the occupation and even most of her stories save for the last like five or six that take place after the Nakba didn't really focus on the occupation and so it's a really interesting book and Adania Shibley the same author of this book wrote in the introduction of it that it's a really important piece of literature a piece of literary work because it kind of sort of explores what was and the possibilities of what could be again. A lot of the stories about the mundane everyday tragedies of life as opposed to like bigger structural problems and issues and it really sort of you know highlights Palestine in a different light. I didn't like love 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 it. It wasn't like the most entertaining or gripping collection of short stories ever but I think this is one of those collections where it's more about the bigger picture of what it means as opposed to the actual like work itself. I would definitely recommend it. I'm gonna end off by talking about some non-fiction books. The first two of which were also on Palestine kind of. This one is Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, Ferguson. Ferguson, Palestine, <laughs> and the Foundations of a Movement by Angela Davis, of course, who is a very well-known activist from America. This is a compilation of interviews, well, I think one or two interviews, but mostly speeches that Angela Davis delivered in like the last 10 years of her activism or so, which reflected on a life of activism, basically. And the main sort of, the nexus of this book, really, and all of these uh, essays or rather I would say speeches was the importance of solidarity and interconnectedness in movements. It's not just about being an ally or whatever that means but it's about seeing other people's struggle as your struggle and also seeing your struggle and their struggle as interconnected as you know if if I'm if I'm not free you're literally not free either. If you're not free then my freedom is not guaranteed either. All oppressions are rooted in a very deliberate global system that is still alive and running today. And so this book is really about highlighting that and understanding that and about carrying that knowledge with you in everything that you do even if it's the smallest things, and to remember that everything is connected. I also listened to the audiobook of Except for Palestine by can't remember the name of the authors, <laughs> sorry, but you're seeing it on the screen, of course. This is a book that is essentially about the ways in which the American political system is designed around having to support and bolster Israel and what it's doing. It talks about how all American presidents, even the least offensive ones like Obama, were all very much in support of the Israeli state and its occupation, even if some presidents uh, expressed more sympathy with the Palestinian cause. The establishment of Israel at the end of the day was for, you know, Western powers to have access to that land so that they can 
maintain a global level of supremacy that, you know, Angela Davis talks about in this book. So the book really goes into how all of the policies regarding Palestine by the U.S. and policies that were even designed to try to help Palestinians were all, like, fundamentally and structurally rooted in supporting Israel. I thought this was a really good book. Like, if you want to know about American foreign policy, like, if you want to do more research on American foreign policy, particularly as it relates to Palestine, this is essential reading. I did have some, like, critiques of it. I felt like they could have gone a little bit more into their critique of nationalism and the concept of a nation itself. Tonal shift because the final book I have to talk about was RuPaul's memoir, and um, it's called House of Hidden Meanings. RuPaul is RuPaul. Yo, I don't need to tell you who RuPaul is. I love this show. I watch Drag Race all the time. It's like my... Like, if I'm not watching YouTube videos or reading books or doing work, I'm watching something Drag Race related. <laughs> so I figured that it would have made sense for me to, to read this book. I decided to listen to it on audio. RuPaul himself reads it. And it was great. This is a interesting book. It kind of sort of like goes into RuPaul's life, I think, up until like the early 2000s. So we basically read about his childhood and his entrance into drag and into you know the hollywood and you know fame industry i don't i'm losing my words right now this was a really good book i think what i liked about it was that it really contextualized rupaul a little bit more for me like i can see how this person became the person that they are today and what i also really like about it was just reading about rue's ambition and determination like rupaul really just wanted to be a star and that's what happened and yeah I just found that to be quite inspirational. So, thank you, RuPaul. That's the first 11 books that I read for the year. It's an odd bunch of books, I'd say. I, I only read one book that I think truly, like, really stuck with me. I mean, some of the other books, like, this one was impactful, and I really did enjoy the Wayward Children books as well. But I hadn't really been reading those hard hitters until July. Like, I read three books in July so far, and they were incredible, but I'm saving them for my July wrap-up. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've read any of these books, if you have any thoughts on them, if you have any recommendations, please let me know in the comments down below. I hope you have a lovely day, and until next time, inshallah, keep reading.